for uh, having me come to, to talk today. My name is Mitesh Patel. Um, as, uh, as I mentioned, so I'm a physician, a practicing physician at the, the Philadelphia VA Medical Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I see primary care patients and then also attend on the inpatient setting. Uh, and I wear a couple of, of different hats. Um, I also co-founded a startup named DocFin um, that uh, Penn was one of the first hospitals we launched at. It's grown to like 600 hospitals now um, and is based out of New York, which is where I live. Um, and then I'm also an assistant professor at, at the university at the medical school and at Wharton and I spend um, most of my time doing research in behavioral economics and connected health. Um, anything from evaluating how uh, patients in the hospital are doing with new technology to running uh, randomized control trials using mobile devices. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, some background around kind of what this buzzword of connected health is, why, why it's important, how, how things in the market are changing. And I'm going to spend, uh, talk a little about behavioral economics, which is what I, my background is, um, and how that applies here. Um, and I think that one of the most important things that, that people should focus on when they're thinking about technology is how is this technology going to change people's behavior? Because at the end of the day, that's what really matters. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about wearable devices. Uh, we had a paper that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association last week, so I'll be going through some of the stuff that we talked about there. So the average person spends a few hours a year with a doctor or a nurse, um, but they spend almost 5,000 hour waking hours doing everything else within their everyday lives, whether it's deciding what to eat, whether to exercise, or remembering to take their medicine. The current health care system fails this setting. It's reactive, it's visit-based, and that's just not sufficient. It emphasizes care when patients get sick, um, allocates most of the resources to just those couple of hours when you interact with the, with the health care system, as opposed to the 5,000 hours that you spend in the rest of your everyday lives. Imagine a different system, one that's proactive, that passively monitors behaviors within the setting of your individual lives, um, and that anticipates when you need more attention and can address those issues before you come, become sick. This is the, the potential or the promise of what, why people are so interested in connected health and wearable devices. There are, there are three significant evolving trends that are kind of driving this change. Um, the first is around technology. So, so as I'm sure you guys know, there have been lots of innovations in mobile technology. These things allow us to monitor people's behaviors in the setting in which they carry out their everyday lives as opposed to monitoring them in the hospital. Um, last year, 50% of adults in the United States had a smartphone. This year, 65% of adults have a smartphone. That numbers continuing to increase rapidly. So everybody's got some kind of device on them. Incentives have significantly evolved, specifically the science of how we can motivate people to change their behaviors. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the principles of behavioral economics that are important to try to incorporate in some of the technology that you're building. And the last thing, as mentioned before, was that healthcare financing is shifting focus. The Affordable Care Act has ushered in a, a new wave of changes, anything from increasing the proportion of someone's health insurance that can be used for outcome-based incentives from 20% to 50% to covering all preventative screening tests when you're going to see the physician. And these three things are really driving a lot of this change. So, you know, why is this important? Well. The science of motivation has really evolved. When we think about how we're going to use technology to change people's behavior, um, we really, really learned a couple of things in the past. So, you know, there used to be a lot of effort spent on providing people with information. This assumes that people are just unaware. So, if you tell somebody that smoking is bad for them, they'll stop smoking. That tends not to work too well. You've got to have that fundamental understanding, but it's not good for driving behavior change, speci specifically when it comes to things that are that are hard to do, like lose weight or quit smoking. Standard economics assumes that people act rationally, that they eat well and exercise regularly because that's going to get them better health. They skip out on dessert and go for a run instead. Um, and the, 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 in, the, what, what, how we combat that is by increasing the size of the incentive. Behavioral economics takes a different approach. It assumes that people act irrationally, but they do this in predictable ways from common decision errors, and that we can leverage these things to build new interventions to change behaviors more effectively. Uh, one of the key premises here is that the design and the delivery of the incentives is actually more important than the magnitude of the incentive. So this, this is important because, uh, because of a lot of the changes that have gone through. One of the things I mentioned was wellness incentives. Um, this is a, a chart from the Wall Street Journal recently. Um, it compares in the blue bars to, are the percentage of large employers that are using wellness incentives to try to change employees' health. 
um, employees cover about two-thirds of the adults insurance in this country and so are a large driver and payer in this country and so you can see from 2009 to 2013 the proportion of of employers that use wellness incentives went from a little over 50 percent to, to more than to almost 90 percent in just a couple of years um, and if you think about the new changes in the Affordable Care Act so what does 50 percent of your health benefits premium mean well if you have a family of four you probably pay about ten thousand dollars for health insurance so employers are allowed to use up to five thousand dollars now to either give you rewards or discounts or to or punishments if you behave healthy or you don't behave healthy um, you can see that across that same period from 2009 to 2013, before this new change went in effect, the, the value of incentives has already doubled from 250 to, to 500 per year. Um, and that is going to continue to increase probably faster as we move forward. So I'm going to run through quickly some of the insights or common things of, from behavioral economics and then, and then go right into the, the part about wearable devices. So um, one of the most common decision errors is, the, is default bias. Def defaults exist everywhere, um, whether it's when you go to McDonald's and order a sandwich, it, it automatically comes with fries as opposed to carrots. Um, in the United States, by default, you're not an organ donor, whereas in many European countries you are. The rates of uh, percentage of population that's an organ donor in those countries is closer to 95 percent compared to 20 25 percent in the u.s so defaults are very important whether you opt in or opt out to stuff can really change someone's behavior people tend to be very present bias they want immediate gratification um, a, a lot of the the programs that employers use is you know go to the gym a certain number of times or get your bmi under 25 and you'll get 500 dollars off of next year's health health premium. That tends not to work because people don't, people want to do stuff right now. So if you can make those rewards immediate and frequent, that can really have a significant impact. People tend to overrate small probabilities and the best example of this is the billions of dollars that are spent in state lotto tickets uh, annually. Um, even though the chance of winning this is one in some odd million chance, people you know, buy these tickets week after week because they think there's a chance of winning. So some of, this, some of the randomized control trials we've done is we've compared giving somebody a, a certain num you know, giving somebody a certain goal, let's say it's walk 7,000 steps, and then comparing what happens when we give you $3 if you walk 7,000 steps versus we put you in a lottery where you have a 1 in 10 chance of winning $10 and a 1 in 100 chance of winning $100. We find that people do much, much more um, activity when they're put in that lottery because it's not only is it um, leveraging overweighting the small probabilities you have a chance to win hundred dollars which really excites people um, but it's variable rewards it's not constant and the variable reinforcement has been demonstrated in many studies to be more effective than constant reinforcement um, loss aversion comes from a theory called prospect theory. People tend to be more loss averse. Um, so in one study we compared you know, giving people $3 a day versus saying you know, we're going to give you up front $90 for the month and every day you don't walk a certain amount, we're going to send you a text message that says sorry you lost $3 today and that tends to be much more effective. Um, and then how we frame information can be very powerful. Um, so one of the best examples of this is it, you'll probably notice that in Philadelphia, if you go to a fast food restaurant, they have calories on the menu. And this launched a couple years ago in Philadelphia and with the Affordable Care Act is now going nationally. But there's been really no good evidence to show that this really helps people um, eat less calories. And it may be because people don't know what, you know, the people who really need to eat less calories don't know what does 600 calories mean. Imagine if you said that if you eat one of these items every, every week for a year, you'll gain 35 pounds. That's, that's really more salient and really helps you understand what that means. And then there's this concept of regret aversion, which is tell individuals what they would have won had they been adherent. Um, so a lot of times people are eligible to you know, get $500 back if they go to the gym. If they never go to the gym, they just never go to the gym. But you know, if you tell them, um, hey, you didn't go to the gym, you, just, you, know, you could have won $500 or you send them a certain reminder each of the days that they're supposed to go, um, that, that's really been shown to motivate people to change behaviors. So how does this apply um, to changing what people do? I, so I live in New York. This is a shot from Penn Station of the escalator versus the stairs. Um, as you can see, there's only one person taking the stairs. So how to get people to, to change behaviors? Um, so we talked a little bit about providing education. Really has not been demonstrated to work. Um, a lot of this has been built into this concept of the quantified self, which is you know a, a lot of more information about your own behavior, um, getting feedback and seeing how you do against others. And there, there's still really the, the, the the evidence is still a question there in terms of that's really effective. 
Um, there's financial incentives, carrots and sticks, using insights from behavioral economics, and there's also show, social incentives. Um, so leveraging things like peer influence or support, being accountable to the team, um, building, you know, having a reputation amongst your other teammates, or having a unified uh, a unity towards a common goal. Um, a lot of workplace wellness programs are looking for ways to use competition or social norms feedback to motivate people. So I'm going to talk uh, now about wearable devices for population health. The, as I'm sure you probably all know, this is a picture of the Apple smartwatch, um, the Apple watch that's coming out. So you know, Apple, Google, Samsung, Microsoft, many others are entering this lar enlarging market of population health. But only about 1% to 2% of adults in the United States own a wearable device. Uh, despite that, it's estimated that the sales will increase to $50 billion over the next few years. The technology for wearable devices has really evolved rapidly just over the last 18 to 24 months. Um, this is a picture of uh, the Spire on the left and kind of breaking down the components to show you how some of these things have changed and really have enabled us to get this in the hands of consumers. So, you know, Bluetooth low energy technology was launched in 2011 and was able to be paired with the iPhone 4S. Um, wireless charging coils first hit the market in 2013. Um, one of the most significant things that, that people often overlook is that the price of accelerometers has fallen fourfold um, in the last couple of years. Basically every wearable device that there is has an accelerometer and measures your steps and the reason is because these accelerometers are so cheap now. But probably the most important thing is that we've been able to offload the, the computational data from the device to putting it through a, another device into the cloud. So you don't have to build processors or other things within the actual wearable technology. You can just send the data to another device like a smartphone and you can do that in the cloud. And that's what's really enabled these things to, to at least what's given them so much potential for, for being able to impact population health. There's a lot of companies working on this stuff. So the, this is a snapshot from one of the Rock Health reports. So the first three um, are movement, heart rate, and sleep. That's where the majority of um, companies have been thus far. But you can see that there's a ton of different other areas, including brain activity, like the, you know, the, the Muse uh, oxygen level, heart rate variability, muscle activity, and so on. Um, so there's a lot of companies out there. Um, it's still unclear, um, you know, which one of the, how well these devices work, or which ones are actually changing behavior, um, and that's what I want to talk about. So when you think about wearable devices for changing behavior, the hope is that these things can educate and motivate individuals by recording data about their everyday lives towards better habits and better health. The problem is that there's not much evidence that these devices alone, so for example, just giving somebody a Fitbit or a wearable device is going to get them more healthy. Now, there are some people, probably many of the people in this room that are more engaged in their health, that are, that are more into this and motivated, and for those people it may work, but for the large portion of people in this country, um, the, it, it doesn't because they, they're less motivated and people with chronic conditions, the people who need these devices the most. There are really four key challenges that need to be addressed. The first is that the people who really need the device have to be able to, like, to have it. They have to be motivated enough to want it, and they have to be able to, to obtain it. And this is challenging because many of these devices are quite expensive. Um, you know, the, the lease that some of these cost is $99. The Apple Watch starts at $349, goes up much higher. So these are really unaffordable for a lot of the patients that you see over at the hospital just down the road. There was a recent survey of wearable device users to get a snapshot of who's using these devices. So 75% described them as early adopters of technology, 48% were younger than the age of 35, 29% made over $100,000. So the individuals that really need wearable devices are probably not the ones that are using them yet. There are a couple of ways that we can combat this. If we can find that wearable devices are effective, they could be financed much in the same way that prescription drugs are. Um, of course, there, there's not much data to show these devices are effective yet, but if there are some, then that, that's a possibility. Another method is that insurers or employers might offer to give these away to people. So a lot, a lot of insurers say, there you go, uh, Oscar has partnered with Misfit Wearables and is giving this to their, to, to their members. And so these are different opportunities that may arise, and there's a, there's a larger number of these uh, happening um, more recently. The second thing is you need to, once you have the device, you have to regularly use it. This means regularly wear it, 
recharge it, sync the device. These are additional behaviors that we're asking people to do who already have shown us they have a difficult time changing their behaviors. And there's a lot of evidence to show that these small things can really hinder people from effectively changing their health behaviors. Um, you know, wearable devices need to be charged sometimes daily. Um, if you want, really want the, the information to be uh, readily read back to you, you often have to sync it with another piece of equipment like a smartphone or a laptop. Uh, there was a, a recent survey from Endeavor Partners showed half of people that use wearable devices or purchase wearable devices stop using them within, and a third of them with, stop using them within six months. There has been an evolution of wearable devices, which, which shows some potential promise. So if you think about, there was decades where the, the th for ac of activity trackers where pedometers were your activity tracker. The idea here was that you actively carry these things by clipping them on um, your waist. You know, they were relatively affordable, 10 to $50. But you had to manually log your data. You had to either look through the, de the device if it captured it or write it down. Most of the studies that had been done are where people kept a journal log. And that was really tedious. The adoption is really low. There's, uh, you know, I'd be surprised if anybody here was carrying a pedometer. Um, wearable devices have received much attention. The idea here is that you actively wear them. So you know, it, there might be other reasons to wear them as opposed to carrying them. They're much more expensive, like we talked about, all these additional steps. Adoption is still low, but less than 2% of people have a wearable device. Smartphones, in contrast, are different. The idea here is that you passively carry these devices, which means you're not carrying them to track your activity, but you're carrying them to ha be able to contact your friends, check your email, and they have the capability to, to actually to track your activity. Once you have a smartphone, which two-thirds of adults in the United States do, the apps for these things are typically free, so very affordable to people who have a phone. You don't have to have any effort to be able to take this information and then spit it back out to the user in a way that can be um, show them how they're doing against others. It can happen passively because the cell phones are connected, because the phones are connected through cellular. The adoption, like we said, is really high, two thirds of people in the United States. For those of you that have an iPhone 6 or have iOS 8, um, all of those phones are tracking your activity now. You can't even turn this off. Um, and so by default, Everybody who has an iPhone 6 has an activity tracker, whether you know it or not. Um, Apple's built in a bunch of other places to be able to connect with other apps and wearables, so one day you might be able to connect other things. Um, but you can see how much progress has just been made in the last 12 months in this. The next step is that wearable devices have to be accurate, whether it's tracking physical activity, heart rate, or sleep patterns. Um, there's been a, a decent amount of study looking at physical activity, but not much else. So it's, it's unclear whether or not these devices are accurate. Um, there's, there, there's you know, an interest in you know, considering ways to properly provide oversight over these devices, but, but to our knowledge, there, there isn't really a good, good, uh, good way to do this or evaluate which devices work. And then wearables might not make sense for all outcomes. Like you can't imagine that someone's going to wear a blood pressure cuff with them the entire day. But you might be able to pair this with a blood pressure cuff um, so that it can help remind you when you've missed a dose of your medication that it's time, you know, time to take a medication. The last step is in order for these things to work, let's say you have a wearable device, you're actively using it, the device actually works and tracks everything, you've got to be able to then take that information that you captured and, and spit it back in a way that actually sustains behavior. And this is hard because most people are not motivated to change behavior, at least the ones that need to change. That's why they have, that's why they are obese, so they smoke and so on. Um, and, and we really feel that the sustained engagement is, is uh, technology may help facilitate some of this, but sustained engagement is more driven by the engagement strategies that can be designed around these things and connect with human behavior, leveraging some of these concepts from behavioral economics. One of the keys to this is designing effective feedback loops, using a trigger that grabs an individual's attention at those moments when they're most likely to take action. Um, rewarding behaviors using either financial or social incentives. It could be something like uh, someone on your team that's participating in the same thing um, gives you some positive support or it could be one of these types of lottery designs that I described. And then how do you take these things and build new habits? In order to do that, you either need to take external motivations and turn them into internal ones, which is really hard, or you need to sustain external motivations for a long time, which is also really challenging. And I'm going to talk a little bit about using triggers. So here's an example of an external trigger. This is information that you see um, that tells you what there is to do next. So for, for example, you might get a text message that says, it's a re reminder to exercise. You might see a sign in, in the building where you work or go to school that says, take, you know, take the stairs, you can lose X number of calories. Um, or you might, get a, you might set an alarm on your own phone at 5 p.m. when it's time for you to go run. 
Um, so these are these are the types of external triggers. Now these are in order for these to work, you either need to sustain these, doing them over and over, which is hard because you know a text message every day tends to tends to get dulled down, or there's so much other noise that you don't pay attention to it. Or you need to turn these into internal triggers. Um, internal triggers are things where you have some type of some type of sensation or emotion which elicits uh, a change in behavior. So what are some companies that are doing a good job of this? So when you're lonely, um, you might check Facebook. When you're not sure about something, you might go search on Google. When you're bored, you might go to YouTube or Instagram. These are inherent emotions that, use, that, that push you to go and use technologies. These are the things that are, the, are most effective, um, as you can see from examples here. So just to review, so for us, key aspects when you're building technology, you, people must be able to use, obtain the technology, even better if they already have it, like smartphones. They've got to actually use it, so they've got to sustain it. So removing all these additional things that create barriers that can add up. Technology's got to be accurate. Um, and then the, there needs to be a way to form new, sustained habits. Um, the key takeaways, well, well-designed well technology can really help to facilitate behavior change, but it may not be driven by these devices alone. Ultimately, it's the engagement strategies that connect with human behavior that drive behavior change, whether that's incentives, competition and collaboration, or building effective feedback loops. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, if there's any questions, yeah, happy to take questions. Take, uh, like two to three questions. <coughs> In healthcare specifically, because what you said are good examples of companies uh, from a technology perspective, not necessarily Oscar Health, that have done a good job of building these triggers. So, what are good companies that have helped to change people's behaviors? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's 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 hard to say because there, there's not a lot of you know good data on you know company a lot of private companies even companies like Facebook and so on don't give out much of their data, um, and so one example of uh, so in, we we've done a couple randomized controlled trials using the Moves app, which is an app on your smartphone. Um, the data is uh, isn't out yet or published yet, so I can't speak directly to what the results were. But I can say that the technology itself was not the important thing. I think that over time technology is going to you know continue to improve. It's going to become more seamless. It's going to be more affordable. It was really the engagement strategies, the ideas of you know, using lottery designs, pairing people into teams and putting them into, into competitions, um, thinking about what are achievable goals. A lot of walking competitions set their goals at 10,000 steps. That was, there's no real evidence behind that. Actually, the, the federal guidelines are equivalent to about 7,000 steps. Um, that's much more achievable if you consider the average person in the country walks about 5,000 steps a day. Um, so I, I really think it's, it's it's less about the technology and it's which one of these companies or devices are using the right engagement strategies and I'm not aware of good data on there, out there that, um, that points to any of those. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it's always easier to start with what people are already using. Like I made the case of the wearable devices versus smartphones, you know, just because so many more people have them. Um, it's hard enough to get people to use a device, then it's hard, even harder to get them to use the device to do something else, like lose weight or take their medicines. Now, you know, five years ago, people used to say, you know, we can't use smartphones because nobody has them. Um, we have to stick to, you know, just regular text messaging. Now, now two thirds of people have them. So I, I expect over the next five years, everyone's going to have a lot of these things. Um, but, but I guess, uh, you know, my answer would be that was to leverage the existing technology and to build off of that. Yeah. So you mentioned, you talked a lot about like the data that's being gathered, whether it's passive or active. Um, I think mean, what Oscar is doing is brilliant in the sense that they're, you know, for a lot of these potentially high risk patients, they're allowing uh, a lot of this data to be collected. Though I'm wondering from your perspective as a clinician, Uh, from all this data that's being gathered? 
Uh, you know, I certainly think that there is some concern given given data breaches. Uh, although, you know, you see this in other industries like finance, and as the security gets better and things move forward, this is you know just going to be the way that data is handled. So, I, I think in the short term, yeah, there will be challenges. I think in the long term, that you know, if this, if this is the way that we're going to go, people are going to adapt to this. A as a clinician, I have a hard time seeing how in my you know seven minutes with a patient, I'm going to get to you know of which you know most of that's hopefully talk like 15 minutes of which seven minutes of that I get to talk to them. The other time I'm examining them or on the computer making orders, um, I'm going to be able to also incorporate data on their steps or other things. Now, if there was you know things like what their glucose trends were doing or things directly related to the intervention, um, that might be more you know more possible to incorporate. But uh, you know I think that. You know, medical homes have not only they have clinicians with teams around them, and they like population analysts and so on, population managers. Those people might be able to monitor people's step counts or weight trends, and then raise a flag. Um, but as a clinician, it's really hard to be able to use this data within the the short time we already have with patients. Yeah. I think that's a key question. I, I don't have an answer for that, but I, I think if you can, if you can find a way to take this data and make it so that it's you know a clinician can consume it quickly and then can make a medical decision that's going to improve that patient's care, um, that's that's really what we need to move towards. And there's not really been much study around that. All right. Thank you.